Well, a few housekeeping points before we get started. First of all, you are in the right webinar if you're here to learn more about Third Derivatives Startup Accelerator Program. We're so excited to provide you with an overview. Um, so just a few housekeeping points before we get started. We would love to get to know you, our audience, better today. So there will be an occasional poll question that will pop up during the presentations like you may have just seen. <laughs> um, so please respond if you can. We'll show the poll results shortly after the poll gets posted. So you've got to respond immediately and then you just submit your answer and then it goes away. You can just delete the poll, but it'll sh show what happened in terms of understanding who's in the audience and how people responded. Um, if you have any questions for us, we will be utilizing the Q&A feature for that today. So please submit your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom um, whenever a question comes to your mind. It doesn't have to be waiting until the very end. We can, we're going to be collecting those, um, and so we'll talk about those in the, in, at the end. So we'll try to either answer in the chat or live. Um, we will also be answering questions uh, with our guests at the end of this discussion, so be sure to stick around. And for those who can't participate because of conflict, conflicts or time zone differences, the archive of this recorded um, presentation will be available afterward. So on with the show. Okay, so welcome, first of all, to Third Derivative Startup Informational Webinar. First of all, Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedules to register and participate today. We're super grateful that you're really interested in us. Um, the goal of this one hour event is to provide you with information about us, their derivative, and give you a chance to ask some questions for those of you who are, for those of you who are at startups interested in applying to our program, we'd love for you to do so before our August 25th deadline that's soon approaching. Um, I'm your host, Elaine Shea, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Caroline Winslow, who you can see on this <laughs> deck, and Jamie Hankins, which I will we will introduce later. Um, so the next slide is just a quick summary of the agenda. So first, I'll present a brief overview about D3 and our approach. Next, my colleague, Caroline, is going to present an overview about our Climate Tech Accelerator program specifically. Then Jamie's going to moderate a discussion with three startup founders that have gone through our program or are currently part of the accelerator program. And then finally, we'll open it up for the, to the floor for a general question and answer period, what we're calling an Ask Me Anything, <laughs> um, with our team, including one of our diligence team leads, Ankit Kalanki, and with the startup founders as well. So let's talk about why we exist. So in 2019 and up to early 2020, RMI, formerly known as Rocky Mountain Institute, felt that there were not a lot of good technical solutions for most of the critical emissions that are needed to be abated to fight climate change. And while there could be solutions that currently worked, they may not be economical compared to other alternatives. So we need to drive more critical technical solutions for especially the harder to abate emissions sectors, which make up the majority of our emissions. And then not only that, but we also need solutions to be able to draw down carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, because even by IPCC estimates, as you know, um, if we can reach zero emissions by the year 2050, we still need gigatons of carbon removal afterward. And as many of you know, these technologies have been relatively hard to commercialize for a whole number of reasons. And until the last couple of years, and also uh, this weekend, it's been hard for them to attract investment and support as well. And one of the reasons why hard tech and hard sciences are hard to commercialize is because of a number of different things. One, often the capex, the capital expenditure is extremely large. It's estimated like, for example, a, a new battery chemistry, it takes $2 billion to reach full commercialization. Um, also, the development cycles can be very long, which does not suit well to typical Silicon Valley VC models. Um, and often it's really difficult to reach the customers. So, you know, there are large incumbents at play, regulated markets, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's really hard for new entrants to just come in and meet the customers. So we were built from the ground up as a new model for climate tech commercialization, where we bring together an entire ecosystem of the players in an open collaborative approach to address these challenges. So, as I said, you know, we are built 
from the start to address the need to find, fund, and scale more impactful climate tech innovations faster. Our ecosystem approach brings together the various stakeholders needed to help startups cross the multiple valleys of death that we see in the climate tech commercialization pathways, which I'll get into shortly. And then the way that we do this is by leveraging RMI's incredible techno-economic and regulatory knowledge. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, RMI is an independent nonprofit 501c3 founded by Amory Lovins 40 plus years ago as a think and do tank focused on the energy transition. And now we're over 500 techno-economic analysts, market and regulatory and policy experts all over the world. Um, so by leveraging that expertise, as well as RMI's network of corporations, governments, investors, philanthropies, and other nonprofits, those are all the stakeholders needed to be brought into the D3 ecosystem to help startups across all emission sectors commercialize and scale faster. So back to the valleys of death. So most people think about one valley of death for tech startups. But when it comes to hard sciences and climate tech, startup founders often face multiple valleys of death. You have to form the company, develop the minimum viable product, test it and demonstrate it in a real world setting. And finally, you have to scale massively to build a strong track record. We call these challenges the valleys of death because they are the place where too many promising ventures die. And all of these valleys require the need to have different stakeholders involved. So VCs are involved usually in valleys of valleys of death two and three. Corporate partners are often involved in massive deployment. You need government to set up the monetization mechanisms and the incentives for it, et cetera. Um, so while the technology might be really interesting as an individual stakeholder, it doesn't necessarily move along all the valleys of death because at each stage, the startup needs to re-educate and reaffirm new stakeholders. Also, the investors typically need to know what's going to happen downstream of them before they have the confidence to act. So core to our theory of change by leveraging RMI's know-how, networks, and capabilities, we bring together the various players in the entire ecosystem from the start to help startups by connecting them with the money, the knowledge, and the connections needed to cross these valleys of death quickly and successfully. So while we just launched in December 2020, we're not, we're not that old, we are already seeing lots of successes. So lots of startup applications globally, about 2,000 applications since our launch, um, with about a 7% acceptance rate. And we're rigorously vetting all these applicants and bringing in massive cohorts, so far six, that are all high quality with significant climate impact potential across all greenhouse gas emission sectors, especially the harder to abate sectors. Um, some VC partners have described us, as I wrote in here, um, as the best climate tech deal flow in the world. And many VCs who are not within our direct ecosystem are still part of our deal flow newsletter to keep tabs on our portfolio of startups. So it's a really good thing to be part of our program because you get a lot of really great attention. Um, and we're helping to propel more funding and deals to our startups really quickly with almost half a billion of capital raised by our startups um, including folks who joined less than 16 months ago. In addition to the funding, we have also facilitated quite a few uh, corporate startup um, pilots and deals. Oops, hang on one second. I'm having a quick technical challenge. Okay, so then I wanna get into the actual cohorts. So if you look at this next slide, not the thesis-driven ones, um, speaking of uh, the different successes and the different kinds of cohorts that we've brought in so far, um, our, we've had 110 startups that represent every major greenhouse gas emission sector. And the percentage of representation in our portfolio reflects actual global impact based on IEA estimates. So our portfolio is being balanced based on real impact, not based off of what is hyped from an investor standpoint. We really want to make sure that what we're elevating is going to be the most impactful things um, that make sense with what is actually being the most emissive. So you can see that a lot of the startups have solutions in harder to abate areas that are generally underinvested, like industrial emissions. 
The orange boxes around specific startup logos show the 34 new startups we just announced in our latest two cohorts, one of which is our first focus cohort on carbon dioxide removal technologies under our multi-year first gigaton captured initiative focused on making a more viable market to scale the most promising carbon removal solutions. So speaking of focus cohorts, um, as you saw in this previous slide, this is something we're leaning into in addition to our general cohorts as part of our mission to scale up impactful solutions across all major greenhouse gas emissions at the gigaton scale. In order to move markets faster for critical but nascent climate tech solutions that, are, that our team has identified, we've been working to bring together the full value chain of uh, various focused investors market, policy and tech experts, and corporations interested in specific solution areas. Um, a sample of what is currently being considered in on the slide, if you can see some of the topics. Now, while the current application period that this webinar is about is for our general, our next general cohort, acceptance into the general cohort does not preclude your startup from also being selected to be part of a focused cohort in your specific technology area as more focused cohorts develop. So for example, two of the five current startups in our carbon dioxide removal focus cohort that we just launched were from previous third derivative general cohorts. And um, finally, deep market insights and thought leadership um, are a big deal um, in terms of what we do. So it's, it's really like we publish a lot of quote, thought leadership in this space. Um, unlike most other think tank pieces, our thought leadership's really focused on the market and investment aspects. Um, we have a lot of commercialization knowledge, and that's what people care about in our ecosystem, and that's what's going to get things to scale. So we have free downloadable reports, we have blogs, we're constantly publishing new materials that include technical specifics to look for in particular technology areas, barriers to commercialization, how to overcome them, etc. Um, and some example topics include a piece on windows, long duration storage, ocean CDR, sustainable aviation fuels, and low carbon cement. Um, many of our startups actually have found these pieces to be validating of their solutions, and it's helped them to point to our blog as a credible source for uh, potential investors and partners. Um, so this capability is really something that makes us very unique. Um, and now I'm going to hand it off to our acceleration manager, Caroline Winslow, to provide more information about what to expect as a startup in our accelerator program. Caroline. Thanks, Elaine. Um... Great, so as Elaine shared, um, I am Caroline Winslow. I'm an acceleration strategy manager here at Third Derivative, so focused on supporting our cohort startups once they join the program. So for this next section, I'm gonna be sharing a bit about what to expect um, if you're a startup accepted into Third Derivative. Next slide, please. So we are a global diverse ecosystem that was built to accelerate climate tech globally. So within our ecosystem, we have over 165 expert mentors that have expertise across a variety of technical sectors, functional areas, and based in a variety of geographies. We also have 10 global corporate partners, as well as 17 international VC partners um, that are focused wholly on deal making and commercial road mapping for our startups. Um, this entire ecosystem is in place to support to date our 110 startups, which are uh, distributed across a variety of geographies, sectors, and readiness levels. So you can see a breakdown of the different uh, sectors that our portfolio currently represents here. Next slide, please. So since December 2020, our ecosystem has achieved quite a lot. Um, so there have been over 70 plus introductions made between our corporate partners and startups of just our inaugural cohort, 70% of which can progressed into continued conversations. Um, as Elaine noted, this has resulted in a variety of piloting opportunities and commercial engagements between our startups and partners. Additionally, uh, $475 million has been raised by our cohort startups since they've joined the program, of which $32 million was led or joined by a, an investor partner of Third Derivative and $4 million seeded by D3 specifically. Next slide, please. So what does it take to become a cohort startup? As Elaine mentioned, we have a 7% 
7% acceptance rate, so a competitive program. Um, and the way in which we down select and identify the startups that have the most meaningful potential impact, uh, there's three different phases of our selection process. First and foremost, we screened for climate impact. We want to ensure that each startup that joins the portfolio meets a minimum threshold for annual emission reductions at scale. Secondly, our research team focuses on the techno-economics, so ensuring the technical feasibility, the customer value prop and competition, and the techno-economic pathways to scale are all validated. Lastly, our program delivery team, also known as the acceleration team, is focused on ecosystem additionality. So of that down-selected group of startups that meet the first two phases, we then focus on ensuring that the startups that come into the program, we have not only the right expertise, but the right partners to support them in their pathways to scale and success within the 18-month accelerator period. Next slide, please. So how do we accelerate startups uh, once they join the portfolio? Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to focus on five key areas. First, that we are bespoke. We meet startups where they're at. Um, second, we're heavily focused on commercial and capital deal making. Thirdly, we are accessible and light touch, uh, fully ecosystem driven. And then lastly, we are no cost and non-exclusive. So there are no fees to participate to startups and we offer an optional $100,000 convertible note upon acceptance. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm gonna go a bit more into the nitty gritty and specifics of the Accelerator program. So first and foremost, uh, we are fully remote, globally accessible and non-exclusive. The program is 18 months by design such that we can support startups through a variety of um, different challenges they face throughout their development journey and help them to overcome those values of death that Elaine previously noted. Um, so the ways in which we do this, I will discuss in the coming slides. So next slide, please. First and foremost, tailor-made and light touch. Uh, our program is highly curated and takes an individualized approach. We like to say it's a choose your own adventure type of program. So we recognize that startup founders, you all have really busy schedules. You're working day in and day out, oftentimes evenings and nights as well, to ensure your startup is uh, headed in the right direction. So we try to limit the time in which it takes to check in with us. So we support you through not only a variety of online self-serve resources that you can leverage at any time that you need, but we have monthly check-ins for 30 minutes with uh, one person assigned to you as your D3 connector. We then have quarterly success planning calls to ensure that you're on track uh, to the milestones and goals that you set and we're supporting you in the most impactful areas. And then lastly, there's opportunities for asynchronous updates to not only provide and highlight your updates and key milestone achievements to the D3 team, but our partner network as well. Next slide, please. Uh, next, we are really focused on learning and knowledge sharing within the ecosystem. So our, we have ecosystem generated program um, that is flexible and responsive. So as we unearth and synthesize the needs across our cohort and as new cohort startups come in, we activate our partners to provide content that specifically is addressing these needs. We also aim to ensure that our programming is relevant and engaging. So we achieve this through a variety of different event models, such as roundtable discussions, peer-to-peer -peer events with fellow cohort startups, um, and a variety of startup showcases to our partners as well. Additionally, our content, uh, a large portion of it is evergreen. So as the ecosystem grows, also the amount and frequency of content offering grows as well. Um, lastly, the content is fully digital and persistent. So while there's opportunities to leverage real-time events such as peer-to-peer -peer events and learn from your fellow founders, you can also take advantage of content that is recorded and stored for asynchronous access at your convenience. Uh, so this menu of resources and events is accessible to all cohort startups and is curated exclusively for the challenges and needs you all have. Next slide, please. 
Mentorship is another key pillar of our program. As I shared, we have over 165 expert mentors in the ecosystem. So they are here to support startups uh, with a variety of areas of expertise, network introductions, and more. So here you can just see an initial kind of clipping of the different expertise area, functional skill sets, and geographies that our mentors represent. Next slide, please. Lastly, the program is really focused on capital mobilization and commercial deal making. So we like to say dollars and deals are how we like to leverage our strategic partners to support cohort startups. So within the ecosystem, as I previously noted, we have 17 VC partners that span across five different continents. They're focused on helping D3 startups scale by supporting them through coaching, investment, and governance. Our acceleration team also provides monthly office hours to help startups in their strategy and planning for upcoming fundraises, and then helps with facilitated deal making and introductions to our broad uh, network of investor partners. Secondly, we have 10 corporate partners across four continents that support startups speed their pathways to scale from development to demonstration and on to deployment. Um, so our partners are fully invested in our startup success. They support not only with due diligence on the onset, but also critically provide uh, follow-on investments, um, as well as commercialization mentorship, and then piloting and commercial opportunities, such as joint development agreements, paid pilot projects, things like that. So in a nutshell, D3 is here to support you in a very high-touch curated manner deploying the right resources exactly when you need them, whether that is talking to fellow peer, uh, CEOs and peer founders, to meeting with mentors on a recurring basis, or leveraging our investor and corporate partners on your pathways to securing investment and commercial um, opportunities. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Jamie Hankins, uh, our startup portfolio manager here at Third Derivative, who is going to uh, facilitate a panel with some of our actual cohort startups to learn more about their experiences in the program. So over to you, Jamie. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, and hi, everybody. As Caroline mentioned, I'm the startup portfolio manager on the D3 team. So broadly responsible for overseeing our servicing function and how we add value to our startups throughout the program through that. Um, I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage here, three of our startups, uh, Michael Rigney from Altus Thermal, Janice Tran from Canon Energy, and Jason Wong from TS Conductor. Um, Janice and Jason, I'll pass it over to the three of you in a moment to introduce yourselves further, but Janice and Jason were actually part of D3's inaugural cohort launched in December 2020 um, and just transitioned about a month ago, a little bit more, to become our first alumni cohort. Um, so we're very grateful for this group that we built D3 uh, along with and were with us for the early, early stages of our own journey. Michael, on the other hand, joined D3 only this past March. So we have plenty of road together, um, but he'll be a great resource for sharing his experience in these this early three or four months in the program. Um, so Janice, Jason, Michael, thanks so much for being here with us today. Before we get into questions, uh, hand it over to each of you to introduce yourselves, um, maybe a, a line or two about what you're working on at your company as well. Um, Jason, why don't we start off with you? Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Jason Huang, co-founder and CEO of TS Conductor Corporation. We make the world's most advanced conductor to, to faci facilitate the transformation of a power grid to support energy transition to enable electrify everything and eventually net zero economy. Awesome, thanks Jason. Janice, how about you next? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders for Canon Energy. Uh, we work on waste heat and converting that into 24 seven carbon free energy. Um, so we are a developer. We're not necessarily inventing new technology. We're innovating on the business model to, to help industry decarbonize. Excellent. Thank you, Janice and Michael. Last but not least. Hi, everyone. Uh, Altus Thermal is working on home electrification, specifically water heating. So water heating is 18% of energy uses in, use in the home, and um, it is 2% of GHG emissions overall. So we are inventing a product or developing and bringing to market, rather, a product 
um, that will help accelerate that towards zero. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Jumping into questions here, uh, startups in, in general, you know, obviously face a number of hurdles along the path to commercialization and scale. And uh, Elaine touched on some of the ways that that's doubly true for climate tech startups um, in the long development cycles, you know, often a mixture of, of hardware uh, and long adoption. Um, in your experience, can you share some of the challenges that are uniquely faced by climate tech startup founders and CEOs? Uh, in general and in, in the current market environment. Um, Janice, perhaps we'll, we'll kick off with you. Sure, there's there's two things that I think are unique to climate startups that, that come to mind, or at least um, as Canon we faced. And the first is that um, we're, we're battling an incumbent industry. So in my world, it's a lot of industrial uh, companies that have a pressure from their stakeholders to decarbonize. So we're you know, seeing like steel, cement, a lot of oil and gas, they get that pressure. Um, but you know, there, might have, there might be some people within the company that are maybe resistant to that change or dismissive or just too busy to really think about it. Um, and so that creates hurdles to adoption of you know, these new energy transition technologies. Um, the silver lining, though, and what we found is that a company is uh, made up of many different people, not just one. So although we might have, you know, folks that um, don't care or dismissive or, you know, whatever getting in the way, there's also others who are very much willing to champion and want to see this change within their company. So, so that's kind of the good and the, the bad and the good. The other thing I think that's unique with um, climate tech startups is just the dependency on policy. So, you know, knock on wood that this Inflation Reduction Act that just got, got passed through the Senate um, this weekend uh, passes through the House on Friday. But, uh, you know, the bad news is that a lot of um, deployment of renewable energy and other kind of climate tech is reliant on uh, kind of incentives, carbon credits, taxes, things like that. But the good news is that we might actually be seeing some of that come through and that could really create this gold rush to, to climate. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Likewise, Janice. Yeah, something uh, I think a lot of people on the call are, I'm sure are watching very, very closely. Um, but thanks for that perspective. Michael or Jason, anything to add to that? Michael? Sure. Um, thanks, Jason. You, uh, anytime you do a startup, you're just going to face tons and tons of no. And um, that's not necessarily unique to climate tech. It may be more pronounced for climate tech in certain respects. Uh, and certainly when you go and do hardware, which is one of the focuses of third derivative, there's even more no. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that is, I think, tremendously helpful is to come to a community where you get people helping you to find the yeses in a world that is, in, in many cases, you know, so full of full of uh, full of no's. So, um, I think that, you know, so from my perspective, I think one of the important things about going and, and doing a startup is the team and the individuals, the founders, preparing themselves for that journey. You know, in terms of getting up, getting those no's, picking themselves back up, you know, a couple, couple thousand times over, uh, you know, the 10 year journey and, and just, you know, maintaining a positive spirit and continuing onward. Certainly, yeah, Michael, that's, uh, you know, something that we see pretty much unanimously across the cohort for the most part. Um, so a, a common part of the journey and a common frustration. Jason, anything? <laughs> Yeah, I'll keep it simple. Uh, when you have a startup of any industry, you have to focus on team. You have to build a team. Uh, there's also customer and revenue that is always important. And then cash, which is the funding uh, investors. Today's, client, today's environment, uh, we still have a very tight labor market. Uh, that makes it a little bit more challenging to recruit people, um, keeping costs in check. And the other part is the global economy is um, training toward recessions. And we, as funders, we need to be sensitive about that. Uh, really be on the lookout, uh, look out for the team, look out for the business and just redouble the effort, stay focused. Um, Absolutely. 
Um, and this question for for any of the three of you. So with those kind of key challenges and barriers in mind or any others that, that weren't mentioned, um, Janice and Jason over the 18 months so that you were in the program and Michael, you know, so far over the last four months working together and uh, looking ahead, what are some of the ways that you've leveraged D3 to tackle some of the challenges within your own business? Uh, I'll start. <clears throat> I thought that D3 is an enabler for TS in many ways. Um, I mentioned about the customer. Um, we were introduced to Berkshire Hathaway Energy through D3, and we're actually doing a major project with uh, Mid-America in the uh, Mississippi River Crossing. It's a high profile project. Uh, we talked about the funding piece, right? Um, we were introduced to our lead investor, Breakthrough Energy Venture, through D3 as well. And talk about team, you have a really impressive list of uh, mentors and uh, advisors. Uh, that's a great resource to pull from. And we actually had numerous uh, engagements with some as well. So uh, across the board, uh, D3 has been fabulous to startups, especially to TS. So we are very grateful to be part of your inaugural program and appreciate all the support and passion from all the D3 team. Um, it's just unbelievable. Thanks for sharing that, Jason. Yeah, we have a lot of startups that want to double click into like, you know, they're really laser focused on fundraising or another challenge area. Uh, but TS is a great example of kind of how to leverage each of the pillars of, of value prop that, that we offer. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, add to that too. Um, I think what you get from D3 changes over time. So at the beginning, uh, we got one of our investors from from D3 and the Stacky Ventures, and they've been really just helpful on understanding electricity markets and carbon markets and things like that. Um, and then we were also introduced to a few different um, commercial partners as well, some of them who we're still talking to today, but the ones that you know didn't work out, we got some really great feedback on. And so, and then finally, I think, you know, what Jason said about the mentors, we've, we've spoken to quite a few mentors that have given us very pointed and expert advice when we needed it. So it's just, you know, D3 has just been helpful along the entire 18 months have been, been part of it. Yeah, we're earlier, but I would really echo those two comments. Um, we're really pleasantly surprised at the frequency of investor introductions which are coming through D3. Um, it's, it's terrific. Uh, in addition, you know, we're in the built environment and so access to uh, RMI and it's, its expertise is really great for us. Um, and then the mentor introductions, we're excited to take advantage of, particularly as we get a little bit further into the 18 months. We're seeing some really useful things there now, but I think we'll get even more in the future. You guys have kind of each touched on something there that like the 18 month program allows you to lean in uh, or out a little bit based on bandwidth over that long period. Um, and similarly lean into different areas uh, based on, on your own needs. Um, Michael, question for you so far. You know, we're a long by design program uh, and often, you know, advertise as a um, choose your own adventure. Can you speak to how you found the time commitment of the program and, and what's been appealing um, about that as a that model as a founder? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that it's uh, the choose your own adventure aspect is, is ideal for us. Um, and so the number of hours per month is for us right now is single digit. Um, and, and I'm not counting the investor meetings, which, you know, so and things like that. So obviously if that goes to 20 or 30 hours, then great, love it. That's fantastic. Um, but it is, it is really light, which is great. Um, but I think that the thing that I would also add is that the support is very, we find to be very disciplined and effective. And so having, you know, a, a specific guide um, is, we call it a river guide over here, uh, is really useful, um, incredibly useful as a single point of contact. And then we also find Stacker to be a very efficient way for disseminating information to a broader community, both the mentors and the investors. So, um, you know, from that perspective, we find it to be really, just really high ROI, high leverage. Excellent. And uh, for reference, everybody, Stackers are our internal communication tool that 
our startups, our team, our mentors, and all of our partners um, can use to share information and connect with one another. Um, and as has you know, as Michael alluded to, created some really valuable connections. Um, Thanks, Jamie. Jason, Jason, over your 18 months, um, what value did you see in the caliber of the other startups within D3's program? You know, I think the partners and the fundraising and the corporate access is is a huge appeal and foot in the door for a lot of startups, but or that are interested in joining the program. But um, I think something that isn't always appreciated as much as the caliber of the group and the cohort that you join with. Um, so in terms of joining a global ecosystem like D3, exclusively focused on climate impact, uh, how, what value did you find in that? Yeah, Janice, you wanna start? Uh, yeah, sure, sure, I'll, I'll go for it. So um, I'm pretty active in this uh, women and D3 um, regular session. And from there, I've been able to meet some really awesome female leaders and as a you know a female entrepreneur it's always good to we face unique challenges so it's been good to kind of um, talk to others and also just know that you're not alone so that's been great and from that I've gotten really great friends but also some companies that we want to collaborate with so the, the unique thing about Canon Energy is we see ourselves as a broader platform for industrial decarbonization so not just waste heat but we're looking at carbon capture for example and so we've been able to build some deep relationships with some of the people in the group but also just broader um, the broader d3 startup ecosystem and look at all the different technologies and get you know warm intros and and kind of get you know, deeper because we have a shared kind of network. Um, we're also doing a, a collaboration with another D3 company called Banyan Infrastructure. And so they're helping us with uh, the software and operations implementations for our projects. And so it's been you know, great to see how that that relationship has, has blossomed as well. So yeah, I think the quality of the startups that you're meeting here, if you invest, and it's to that point, choose your own adventure, like you kind of create your own opportunities, just like in real life and just like in the startup world. And so if you spend the time investing in the relationships, um, you know, the quality is there, it's just whether or not you wanna tap into it or not. Yeah, what I would add is um, being CEO is a lonely job, uh, you are alone. So having the peer group, for example, D3 has this peer, CEO uh, conference monthly, it helps the people that are on the panel, on the CEO um, peer group, uh, we share the same passion and we face the same challenges. Uh, many, of, many of us also have diverse background in terms of managerial experience. There are also customer contact that we can bounce, bounce off each other. Perhaps uh, I know somebody in the in a customer that they needed to know, or somebody else knows someone that we would love to learn more about. So these are really uh, great resources. In addition to D3, the, the program itself, it's actually the peer, uh, what I would say, the, our peer group, uh, it brings uh, as much value to the ecosystem, um, something that it's actually truly unique. Yeah, it's a great point, Jason. The uh, we do our best, you know, being a dedicated climate platform for for startups to take advantage of those network effects. So you get access in many ways to all of our partners and our mentors uh, and our community. But uh, we are also, you know, working to facilitate introductions to that community to each of their networks as well. Um, so so that's a great great point that you added in. Um, as we wrap up here in the next minute or two. Um, We've touched on a number of different areas. Are there were there, there anything that were you know some of the that surprised you or value that you weren't expecting in terms of resources, community insights, or or events as you joined the D three program, uh, and any guidance or recommendations for startups that are selected on how to best take advantage of this broad menu of uh, of resources that they can take advantage of. I'll go if no one has any comments here. Um, yeah, quite yet. So the thing that I, my closing advice I, I'd say is um, just embrace the community. There's, we're all in this together and maybe unlike some other sectors, 
Uh, I think we're all bound by a common vision, which is to, climb, to, to mitigate climate impacts. And companies will come and go and people will move from one company to another, but building those relationships with people who are going to be key in creating this new, um, this new environment and this new kind of industry is, is, is really good. So I'd say like get out there and just uh, contribute to the community um, and then you know, take from the community as well. And then as well, like the people that you build on your team was a really interesting uh, piece for, for me. Just having the right uh, butts in the right seats um, is really important. And I didn't realize how impactful just having key people at a company is for your success and not having key people in your company and those seats uh, can actually um, be pretty detrimental at the beginning. Yep. I would add that uh, building a successful business is challenging, takes hard work. Um, so for the startups, uh, keep your passion, stay positive, and also be persistent in your pursuit of goals. This really is the best, if not the best, one of the best cohorts um, out there, especially for climate-focused technology companies. Um, you will do yourself a great service if you apply and be part of the digital ecosystem. Um, I would add, I love these comments, uh, I would add to invest the time up front to figure out what's working for you. Um, if once you, you know, are a, once you enter the program and then as you go through the 18 months, you know, your company's probably going to change quite a bit. And so re-examine don't fall into the same pattern over the full 18 months because you're likely to be in a different place over the course of that 18 months. So change it up um, and uh, keep Stacker updated so that you know people are seeing the most recent information because it's easy to let it slip for a month or two uh, when something has happened. And then taking a big step back, I think the most helpful, one of the most helpful things I've ever seen written is that the job of a founder is to figure out what's not working and fix it. And that's actually it, I think, in the earliest stages. There's, there's tons of different domains to the business, but ultimately it comes down to that is figuring out what's not working right now. Um, and then how do you go out and fix that? So it's something I try to remember every day for us is what's not, what's not working? What can we go get? Terrific. Thank you all so much. Um, I hope that that was valuable for all of you that are considering uh, the program. Uh, these are, you know, three power users of D3. And if you have any questions, I invite you to put them in the chat. Um, from here, we're going to transition over to Q&A. So any questions for, for this group here and their experience uh, or, you know, about our selection process, what we're looking for, anything like that, um, please throw those in the chat and, and we'll take the time over the next 10 or 15 minutes to go through those. Um, also invite the rest of my teammates on screen uh, to, to share the spotlight to answer any of those questions. Um, you've met all of them, I believe, other than uh, Ankit, who's on our growth team, who does a lot of the diligence and evaluation um, and the, the technical analysis along the way. Um, so a great resource as well. Um, looking into the chat, uh, a question that I'm going to start with for you, Ankit, is what are you specifically looking for in the diligence process and, and how, you know, the process for determining who gets into the program? Yeah, so uh, for the startups that, uh, that we select into the program, uh, climate impact is definitely one of the, the foremost and important criteria for us. Uh, I think Elaine touched that in her presentation, so that Caroline, and, and we really want solutions that can, that are taking the biggest swings on reducing the CO2 uh, emissions uh, globally. Uh, so that's one of the most important criteria for us. Uh, but in addition to that, we also look for solutions that have a very clear value proposition for their target customers that, that you know, in the market that they are going after and, and the kind of uh, customer segments that they are looking at. Uh, they should be able to demonstrate that they uh, can meet a specific technol technology and cost performance targets. Uh, we know solutions can be in different stages of development, but there should be a pathway to, to clearly demonstrate that uh, those metrics and targets can be hit. And, and 
And from a risk perspective, the minimum requirement is that there should not be any basic science risk. So there should be some uh, basic demonstration, even if it's a bench uh, at bench scale, that, that demonstrates that the, 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 there is no thermodynamic uh, risk uh, that, that exists and, and, and it violates any, any kind of laws of thermodynamics, for example. So those are some of the key, key kind of criteria that are very important for us. And, and the last thing that I'll add is uh, additionality. We really believe in being additive to the startup. So it's very important that um, the startups that we bring in can work with our ecosystem partners and, and, and you know, vice versa as well. Like uh, partners see the value in the startups as well. Uh, as well. So I think those three broad criteria, uh, I'd say, are, are important for us. So Ankit, I'm going to continue to build on the question that you just answered, um, because we're getting a bunch of questions from the audience about maturity stage, like what if I'm 4.5 million already in, am I too late? And other people who are saying I'm a software that is not exactly focused on climate, but it's a cross cutting enabler. And so am I eligible? So can you talk a little bit about like maturity stage that we're looking at, um, the variety of maturity areas and what we su su uh, supply to provide, and then in terms of the uh, kinds of technologies that we're also accepting? Yeah, so in terms of maturity, I think uh, having a having the science risk uh, you know uh, kind of dealt with and all of that would mean that you are at least at trl4 and above uh, from a technology readiness level perspective i think if, if that is where you are then i think uh, you are eligible and and uh, to apply to the program i think the funding uh, uh, stage is not directly kind of affects uh, you know the, the selection process per se we have companies that are pre-revenue that, that apply and have been selected into the program. We have companies that are in that in that C to Series A stage as well that have uh, you know that have compelling value proposition and 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 and, and climate impact and, and and are very exciting and interesting for our partners and that fit the ecosystem that also kind of uh, us have been in the program as well. So um, it, it, the range is wide as long as you are here for and above. Um, and yes, uh, from uh, the kind of technologies uh, angle, uh, we do look at solutions that are, uh, you know, software, uh, all or business model innovations as well, and, and Janice is here, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so we definitely are looking for solutions. Our climate impact evaluation is different though for each of those categories. If it's a hard tech that directly abates uh, or, or, reduce, or, or replaces a, a legacy technology, the criteria is different for an enabling solution like a software, the, 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 the thresholds for climate impact are different. And I think there's a blog on our website, uh, Elaine, that we can perhaps share with the audience as well, that, that shares those thresholds and our methodology around that. But yeah, oh, in, in summary, yeah, we accept all kinds of solutions that can address or enable a hard tech to achieve a certain impact. Yeah, those are those are uh, great points, and a few other questions about you know market focus as well, um, like Emmanuel for, or do we consider startups from you know different geographies, Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example? Um, yeah, absolutely, we do. Um, we are a global remote program, um, so through the selection process, we're focusing, as Ankit mentioned, on climate mitigation and, and carbon reduction potential. Um, even pre-revenue, you know, we're, we're really looking at like at scale. If we can help you cross those valleys of death and reach scale, what is the potential for carbon? Um, mitigation. Uh, and we apply that to every geography. We are really focused on additionality. So we have partners that we're looking to expand to touch more geographies. Uh, but you know, if we have a solution in Sub-Saharan Africa and Nigeria, for example, that um, has massive potential, and we think that we can support you and add value along your journey, um, then that's absolutely in focus. Um, a question here from Felipe for our panelists. Uh, what was the most significant impact on your company from D3's accelerator program? And I'll, I'll uh, Janice, Jason, or, or Michael, let any of you jump in. The We're most pretty. To us, uh, uh, I might say that uh, it's the fundraising aspect. <clears throat> Every startup will need to go through that phase and could use uh, all the help that is possible. And we were introduced by D3 to numerous um, funding options. And we selected the lead investor uh, from, 
from that engagement as well. So I think that that is to us the most important um, enabling um, help uh, these three provided. Michael, you jumped in, I'll, I'll pass it to you next. We're still early, so fingers crossed. So I'll pass, you know, hopefully fundraising, but ask us in a year. That's fair. Yeah, we, uh, my, Michael's working very closely with us on um, a number of investor introductions already, more to come, uh, but uh, we're, we'll follow up with you all. Janice, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing for us is like the mentor network and just the knowledge that comes from the people uh, within D3 and RMI was the biggest help. Um, and then, of course, the, the commercial relationships as well. 50-50 on both. Sure, thanks. A uh, question from Elliot. For the corporate partnership, seems like a diverse set of companies. Do they each have their own types of deals or startups that they're looking for? Or is there a common theme to how they want to work with startups? Um, yeah, there's a lot of diversity in what they are seeking. Uh, we, the tool that Michael had mentioned, Stacker, is a great source for exploring the network. So all of our partners have uh, have a profile there where, you know, our investors have indicated the average ticket size that they write and the sectors of focus and geographies. Um, so we can curate, you know, introduction requests based on those needs. Similarly with our corporates, uh, we have some that, you know, they're pretty widely looking at uh, any sector that our startups are looking in. I think BHE is a good example of that. They have a very diverse profile uh, portfolio while others, you know, uh, corporate partner like FedEx may be a little bit more laser focused on the transportation sector. So that's a tool that our startups all have access to. And you can go in there, read what they're looking and um, looking for, request an introduction and kind of fill out some of the details for our team on how you see your solution benefiting them, the type of uh, partnership or deal that you're looking to strike. And then we can have that conversation with them and, and look to facilitate an introduction. Um, so Elliot, that's a great question. Hopefully, hopefully we answered that. Um, yeah, Jamie, I'm happy to briefly jump in here as well. Um, as, as you noted in the question, you know, our, our partners are spanning not only different geographies, but different kind of primary focus areas, ranging from energy companies to right shipping companies, things like that. Um, the ways in which they work with their derivative and support our startups very much differ by company. So for some, uh, we work primarily just with their business units, trying to find kind of ready to deploy technologies that they can utilize in their existing infrastructure. We also have partners that have corporate venture arms, so they can participate in funding fundraising rounds um, as lead or kind of co-investors. Um, and, you know, I like to think of D3 playing a role of rather than startups, you know, constantly knocking on the front door of corporations trying to get an in we have kind of a backdoor entry, understanding the right people to speak to and the best ways that they can support uh, startups within the portfolio. So not only do we help with just the introductions, but we help with kind of the strategic alignment to ensure it's a right fit for the partners. Thanks for adding that, Caroline. Uh, we have a couple of questions still on, you know, the the selection criteria and which companies are a fit, um, specifically on you know whether if you're 100 percent grant funded and haven't received any venture capital in the past, um, or number of teammates required. We have companies that are you know, we have a limit, uh, a minimum of two full time employees. Um, you know, part of the reason for that is really you know being able to have the conversations and really take advantage uh, and of the time required to, you know, strike a commercial deal. So that's our minimum, but those climb up to, you know, 60, 80 uh, full-time employees or more, you know, by the end of the 18 months. Um, so I would say that if you have received some funding uh, or, and have a larger team, but you really think the D3 network can be additional and add value and help you scale, then to absolutely submit a, an, a, um, an application. Similarly on if you are 100% grant funded so far, you know, that's pretty common. Um, we were just looking when uh, our first cohort transitioned to alumni at where they all started and, and where they finished and you know, a, a pretty sizable portion of that initial 
uh, portfolio, that initial cohort was grant funded at the time of acceptance. Uh, and it was pretty cool to see over 18 months how many had, you know, moved up to seed Series A or even Series B um, and others that continued to bootstrap, uh, but were, you know, closing commercial deals and uh, and scaling steadily without venture capital. So um, we don't have any firm criteria with that. Um, again, we're looking, you know, if we think that there's potential for climate mitigation uh, and we have the ability to help, then, then we want to be a part of that journey. Um, looking at a few other questions, and Elaine, keep me honest on time. Um, yeah, we have a, a, a couple more minutes. Great. Um, how does the program support on technology development, productization, um, or scaling tech from uh, benchtop to third-party testing and validation? Um, Ankit, maybe I can pass that over to you if you have any first points to add. I'll, I'll share initial thoughts, but maybe Caroline and, and you can also share from programming right. perspective. Um, I think uh, we definitely can uh, leverage the RMI uh, network uh, and our partner network to kind of help identify the resources that are required by these startups to, um, depending on where they are in, in, in the process of, you know, uh, their, their commercialization journey. And, and I think RMI today, uh, with, with 500 experts, uh, pretty much has connections with every industry, um, you know, every business, uh, most of the government institutions, agencies out there. So we can uh, we can help these startups find, identify, connect with the resources that are needed uh, to to achieve um, or cross a certain value of that, be it a, a testing validation, uh, you know, finding a site for that or finding a, a vendor for that and, and some of the other resources as well. So, so that's, that'd be my uh, thought. Yeah, and I can jump in as well. Um, you know, what I think really sets D3 apart from other accelerator programs is we do not have a set curriculum that all startups go through. Um, so when startups come to us with a specific request, we work to find the best resources within the ecosystem to address that. So rather than having a curriculum that's focused just say on productization, we work with startups, whether they come to us and say, we're looking for a company that has X infrastructure to run a small scale pilot project, or we're looking for an expert that can look at our existing climate impact models and validate some of our assumptions. So we can really help when it gets down to the nitty gritty and the very specifics um, to ensure that we're helping you in the best way in the challenges that you're facing. Um, so we can support from a range of kind of expertise and insights to introductions um, with other kind of external entities, startups, corporations, things like that to help you on the kind of technology validation and deployment pathway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you know, just a one additional comment there. Um, you know, our tech partners, we're looking to close commercial deals uh, between our startups and our partners. Um, Pilot deals are included in that. And we've seen a lot of successful concrete pilots that are launched, which really do move the needle in that tech validation and moving companies along the TRL scale uh, and giving them some proof points and some data that they can take to market when they're trying when they're talking to other corporate partners of ours. Um, converting their pilot into a commercial deal at the conclusion uh, or, you know, in external conversations not related to D3, if they weren't able to secure a pilot uh, with one of our partners, that's, you know, obviously some, some great proof and validation um, from a third party. Um, if there's a startup in your portfolio, it's in the same space as an applicant. Do you have a non-compete policy that prohibits multiple startups being involved? No, we have startups that are very involved in the same space, operating in different geographies. We have the same startups that are in the same space with a similar solution in the same geography as well. Um, so we do not uh, have any exclusivity there. We, um, we, so we, that's something that we have some experience with. We're all obviously very sensitive to the information that we share publicly. You know, there's uh, the information that you upload in the stacker that shares with the other startups that shares with our partners, you have full control over that. Um, 
So that's something that you can kind of cater to what you are comfortable sharing with the network. Um, and similarly in any peer groups, you know, that you have your own control. Um, but if you see a startup in our portfolio that has a lot of similarity uh, to what you're doing, you know, that does not prohibit you from being involved in the network. Um, D3's North Star is uh, carbon reduction. We're looking at solutions that can be broadly applicable, um, which, you know, typically means that there's space for more than one player in the market. Um, and uh, so we're looking to support a variety of companies in the same sector and across the spectrum. Yes, thank you so much, um, Jamie. We're at the top of the hour, actually one minute late, so very sorry, but thank you so much, everyone, for um, taking the time to join us today. We are we hope this information is useful. We got a ton of questions. We're sorry we couldn't answer all of them. Um, please check out our FAQ on our website, and if you're a startup, we certainly hope you consider applying to our program soon. Our application deadline is just in a couple of weeks, so August 25th. Um, and look out for a follow-up email with the application link and this webinar recording. So in case you want to watch it again, um, feel free to sort of do that or forward it to others. Thank you again so much for your time and have a great week.